hajale heki dutsi lap titumi bitso waka una le potso for our teacher and studio but before that ere kitla ke motsebe hanyane wa bona ke 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 bona hore ke mothajo ang a ratang eng a uthi ya a o ntshele kancane ngokuthi eh utumi utumza ubani yina ithandayo what what does he like doing what are your aspirations mhlambe for for yourself Yeah well to me is um well known as the class clown and um well besides that like okay I'm a soccer player uh into video games but like yeah when it comes to books like yeah I'm on 100 and yeah it's all kosher yeah. we as market all kosher all kosher what is your question to our teacher tell how do i calculate the work done by gravity on an object uh sliding down a slope at a constant velocity. Thank you very much for the question. Let's quickly repeat it for our viewers at home. He asks how do I calculate the work done by gravity on an object sliding down a slope at a constant velocity. Now obviously there's a few key things here that we are going to need to take a look at separately first before we will be able to go and answer a question like this. Now one of the first things is taking a look at the different type of forces that there is. We're going to only discuss the most common ones that we're going to end up finding in your free body diagram. So let's first We'll start off with a few ones. We're going to have a take a look at our normal force. Now you'll notice though that we always end up indicating the symbol capital letter F and then in this case because it's a normal force a capital letter N but it's a subscript to this F. Now the normal force always works 90 degrees to the surface of the object. Now you see I've got two objects over here. One is going to be lying here on a flat surface. 90 degrees to that we're going to be having the normal force working upwards. Taking a look at our object that's on a slope. So that means 90 degrees to the surface and that means this is the slope is our surface is also going to be my normal force. So it looks like it's almost at an angle over there. Now the next force we're going to take a look at is our gravitational force which you're very familiar with. You know that gravity always works straight down from the center of the object. So let's quickly go and take a look at some of our gravitational forces. If I've got an object on a flat surface as we said from the center straight down we're going to be having gravity. And if the object is on a slope here notice still from the center but straight down we're going to be finding gravity now our gravitational force we can always go and calculate from the formula that says mass times gravitational acceleration so as long as i've got the mass i will be able to go and calculate this force now this gravitational acceleration is always given to you as 9,8 meters per second squared now our next force that we're going to be taking a close look at is going to be our frictional force now you know that as long as an object is moving there is going to be friction in Involved. And we actually have two types of frictions if you can remember from grade 11. If an object is moving while there's being a force applied or just moving due to gravity down a slope, we're going to be having friction which we call kinetic friction. On the other hand, if you do apply a force onto an object but it does not move, there is still friction involved and we will call that static friction. So our kinetic friction will be seen as a small letter k though with a subscript or sorry, small letter f with a subscript k and obviously our static friction will be with an s. So the frictional force always acts opposite to our direction of motion. Our next force is our applied force and that one is always either push or pull that has been working onto an object and obviously that force will be in the direction at which this object is going to be moving. Now you'll notice that all of our forces is going to be measured in newtons which is our capital letter n symbol. Let's quickly go on to take a look at forces at an angle. Now you have done this as well last year but let's just quickly recap. If we've got a force at an angle it can be broken up into two components. Okay, which will have the same effect as as that one force. Let's quickly discuss it a bit further. So let's say I've got a little object over here and I'm going to pull with a force onto this object. Obviously, the object will move in the direction of the applied force. But I can also go and apply two forces, one upwards and one towards my right, and if these two forces are applied at the same time, we will notice that this object will be moving in this specific direction. So you can see it's going to have the same effect as my original force. So components are two forces that will have the same effect as one force and then we can end up using trigonometry to go and calculate the values of these specific components so let's go and take a look just at a rough example as to how we can end up calculating these different forces components so first off you'll notice here i've got a little box i'm going to apply a force at an angle you'll notice so this theta 
is to the horizontal. We can go and broke, break up this force into its two components, which will be a vertical and a horizontal component. Now note though that these components are always working 90 degrees to each other. Now what we are going to do is we're going to add them up into what we call a vector triangle. And when we add them, we add them what we call head to tail. So that means, let's first add up the first one, starting with X. Where X has ended, we will start with the next one, which is then my Fy. And then we'll notice that the applied force is going to be the overall effect. And this applied force, which is also known maybe as your resultant force, will always start where the very first force has started and end where the very last force has ended. And that's going to be my overall effect. Now you'll notice though that there's a little angle in between here, which we're going to be making use of. And this is then where my sine cos will kind of come in. We will be able to calculate the vertical and the horizontal component. So let's quickly take a look. For my vertical component, which we're going to see as F1, we'll notice that it's opposite to this angle. And if it's opposite and I've got the F applied as my hypotenuse, I'll be end up using sine to determine F1. So F1 will be sine theta times my applied force. On the other hand, if I want to determine our Fx, which is going to be the adjacent one, we'll obviously end up using cos theta, multiply F applied to determine Fx. Now we must also be able to apply this to an object on a slope and this is the most important part. If we take a look here at a free body diagram for an object that is going to experience no friction, we'll notice that gravity will be working straight down onto it. Normal force is always 90 degrees to the slope and then if we go and place this Cartesian x and y plane of us on the slope, we realize mm -mm, gravity is now the force working at an angle. So we're going to be breaking up gravity into its two components, but we won't be calling it Fy and Fx anymore. We will be calling it Fg parallel to the slope and Fg perpendicular to the slope. And once again, you'll still notice that it's 90 degrees to each other, these two components. Okay, so please make sure though, it's always Fg parallel and Fg perpendicular. So we're not referring to Fx and Fy anymore. Good. Now let's go and take a look at how we will be able to calculate the values of Fg parallel and Fg G perpendicular. Once again, we must be able to place them in a closed triangle. So once we start off with FG perpendicular, we'll need to start then where we've ended with FG parallel. And this is then noticing that FG is going to form the hypotenuse. This is though placed a little bit skew, but if we're just going to draw it straight down, we'll notice this is FG perpendicular and FG parallel will follow obviously horizontally from there. And now you'll see quite nicely that FG actually forms for us the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. Now this little angle theta over here will always get repeated again between Fg and Fg perpendicular. Let's just quickly take a look as to why that's the case. Remember that gravity always works straight down. So if you've been given the angle of the slope to be 30 degrees, note though that gravity will actually hit the bottom part here at 90 degrees and that would mean that if I need to determine this little angle at the top, it will be 180 minus 90 minus 30 because all angles in a triangle should give me 180 and that makes it then 60 degrees over here. Now notice that we still have Fg parallel and Fg perpendicular and then it would mean though because these two are 90 degrees to each other if this part is 60 my last part over here will be 30. So as said always between Fg and Fg perpendicular that theta will get repeated again and Fg will always act as the hypotenuse and you do know how to go and calculate Fg that's your mass times gravitational acceleration as we've seen earlier on. So just to recap, there we've got it. Theta gets repeated again between Fg and Fg perpendicular and as we said, Fg will always act as the hypotenuse. Now let's quickly go and determine our Fg parallel and Fg perpendicular forces. Remember that we've used trigonometry before, we will still use trigonometry. Now that angle though will just be a little bit different than we might have expected it before. So taking a look at my close triangle here on the sheet, we'll notice that Fg perpendicular and Fg parallel, which forms my close triangle here at the bottom, will make that Fg parallel is now going to be opposite to the angle and because that's then opposite it will be sine theta times Fg to determine Fg parallel. Fg perpendicular on the other hand will be adjacent to this angle so that means we're going to end up using cos theta times Fg in this situation. Okay so always people doesn't matter what they say Fg parallel is always going to be for you sine theta and Fg perpendicular is always going to end up being cos theta. Kiruzi mona le house si tati ya tubuza nguzo huti shere waruna ya studio hajole chini kibuwa lwe na but before that ukoreke kimoza hore wena house si tati 
le monsena setlang ke eng di goals tsa hao tso mohlomo mo batla ho ipona o soliteng ka ka ipona ke tsa paramedic that's the dream that i want to do okay so kama ntsoma batla ho ba e paramedic why o batla ba paramedic i love doing that cuz last year i was doing in in a sing but now ke atlo tsa paramedic cuz e ko mading a ka ntwe o yeah o rata ba o thusa ba thu so na muthajo wa lovena yeah i like to help people Mhm. Ai Maroc ora ta hampu iketsa shy. How come mona di camera di dim memo? Hey, what is your question to our teachers in studio? If an object is pushed up a slope at a constant velocity, how will I able to calculate the force applied? Well, thank you for that question. Let's just quickly repeat it for our viewers at home again. She asked, if an object is pushed up a slope at a constant velocity, how would I be able to go and calculate the force applied? Now, there is different types of forces that we're going to quickly discuss, and they are going to be called conservative forces and non-conservative forces. Okay, so let's take a look at our first one. Our conservative forces, these are forces for which the work done in moving an object between the two points is independent of the path taken. And the most important thing about this is, is you should know that an example of an conservative force is always going to be gravity for you on the other hand your non conservative forces they're obviously a bit the opposite of your conservative forces this is then where the forces for which this work we're going to end up calculating in moving the object between two points will be dependent on the path taken and those examples are things like frictional force air resistance tension your applied force basically all your other types of forces that we've discussed today they will fall under our non conservative forces now in order to go and calculate the work done we're going to end up using the following formula now luckily for you this formula will be given to you on the formula sheet it's basically stating that the work is equal to the force times the displacement times cos theta now this angle theta will always be between the force that we are calculating in the question and the movement of the object so just as a quick example for example if we want to determine the work done due to the gravitational force then we would note though this theta would be between the movement of the object so in this case let's say that the object is moving down the slope and fg parallel that's now the force in the question we would notice though that these actually because the movement's in the same direction as fg applied no degrees between them so we're going to have cos 0 and that actually gives us 1 so as we said theta is always between the movement of the object and the specific force that you are using in your calculation okay so now let's quickly go move on to our next part of this question which you asked us now about a constant velocity now very important you should remember from last year constant velocity means that there's no net force so just to take again and look at an example here we'll notice though that if this object was on a flat surface that means my applied force and my frictional force will cancel each other out to give me a net force of 0 now let's apply this to an example Don Dilly applies a force F to help his friend in a wheelchair to move up at a constant velocity keyword there. The ramp makes an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. The combined mass of his friend and the wheelchair would be 100 and the frictional force between the wheelchair and the surface will be 20 newtons. Okay, so here's a little diagram. We need to go and calculate the magnitude of the force exerted on the wheelchair by Don Dilly. Now the first thing that you always need to do whether they ask you in the question or not is to go and draw for yourself a free body diagram. So for this specific example our free body diagram will look as follow we're going to have a f applied force of landuli on the wheelchair there's still the normal force of the wheelchair and then i have rather decided to break fg up into its two component which is fg parallel and fg perpendicular and notice though that there is still friction that's always opposite to the direction of motion good from this because this thing is traveling at a constant velocity it means that all my downwards forces will be equal to all my upwards forces and therefore that means if I need to determine if applied I just need to go and add friction and fg parallel together now luckily for us friction value was been given to us as 20 newtons the only thing that we still need to do is to go and determine fg parallel and as i said from our previous lesson fg parallel is equal to sin theta times fg so if you go and punch in our values we'll notice that we can get 490 newtons for fg parallel and if we add that to my frictional force of 20 we'll end up with 510 newtons which will be the applied force 